for uh, being here. I'm going to be a little formal today because I want to read from uh, a part of the project that I've been working on over the summer that uh, has been possible or was made possible uh, uh, by the generous funding of the IPCCR. Um, over the summer I gave two talks, they were related talks. One was in Berlin at the Freie Universität Berlin. Um, this talk is uh, the talk that I gave there, uh, a, a more refined version of it. Uh, and you all speak English and my audience there was in German-speaking audience that uh, 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 understood English but doesn't know a whole lot about free speech in the way that we understand free speech. So it was a little, uh, uh, there was a little bit of a disconnect. And then the second part of, uh, um, of my summer was in, um, in uh, Belgrade and Serbia uh, at the IFTR conference where I gave uh, um, uh, a talk on the two case studies related to this. Uh, so what I want to talk about today uh, with respect to this notion of guerrilla equivocation is, uh, is the notion of the ambiguity associated with theater as a form of artistic practice and the anxiety that it has caused <coughs> people uh, in the legal community uh, when they're trying to define uh, the limits of free speech. <coughs> and uh, uh, so, um, so let me give you the talk. Uh, so that you have some sense of how it goes. Um, this is the first part of the talk, is, uh, uh, is called Fanning False Flames. Um, and I want to go back to 2006. What was the title again? Uh, the title again? What's that? What was the title again? Well, the title, the, uh, the title of the piece is actually Staging Sedition or Guerrilla Equivocation. Um, this particular section of the, uh, uh, the, the longer chapter is called Fanning False Flames. Right? And, uh, uh, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, a critic, a British critic by the name of Christopher Hitchens. Uh, um, some of you will know him as somebody uh, who was quite involved before he died uh, in, uh, in debates about uh, uh, atheism and the existence of God. Uh, and, uh, uh, but he was a kind of marvelous polemicist uh, as well. So in November of 2006, roughly five years before he died in 2011 of esophageal cancer, the writer Christopher Hitchens was invited to the University of Toronto's Hart House uh, debating club to participate in a public debate. Uh, the debate centered on the proposed resolution that, quote, freedom of speech includes the freedom to hate, unquote. A fierce advocate of the notion that the only proper answer to hate speech, or any other speech for that matter, is not restriction or censorship, but more speech, Hitchens enthusiastically embraced the evening's resolution, and in his defense of it, he reaffirmed the widely accepted notion that as a matter of principle, the concept of free speech requires, and indeed has as its fundamental prerequisite, um, a tolerance of ideas that we find repugnant or heinous. Uh, to illustrate this very point, Hitchens uh, took the opportunity of his lecture to offer a spirited defense of the discredited British historian David Irving, who has the infamous notoriety of being one of the West's best-known Holocaust deniers, and who earlier in 2006 had been convicted in Austria on charges of, quote, trivializing the Holocaust, unquote, in lectures he had given back in 1989 in the cities of Vienna and Leoben. Uh -uh. Rather than actually casting his lot with the substance of Irving's deeply flawed and uh, arguably anti-Semitic uh, scholarship, Hitchens was really only using Irving's case to echo notions of free speech that are traceable as, uh, uh, at least as far back as the Enlightenment and that are often associated with the likes of Voltaire, uh, uh, who is reported once to have said, quote, I despise what you say, but will defend to the death your right to say it, unquote. Noble that this pronouncement may be, the problem is that Voltaire never actually said this. <laughs> and consequently, there's no small irony in this often cited misattribution, which seems to magically surface in places where one would least expect to find it. Like in the opening of Nigel Warburton's 2009 primer, Free Speech, A Very Sp Short Introduction. Indeed, 
The frequent citation of this misattribution to Voltaire means that one of the more popular defenses of the concept of free speech is apparently built upon the implicit assumption that we can defend free speech best by putting words in other people's mouths, and thus by attributing speech to them, the formulation and production of which was not of their own free making. This is obviously not what one thinks of as free speech, since in practical terms it is speech that is dictated, or as was the case with Voltaire, it is speech that is falsely ascribed. But under different circumstances, this is the kind of gesture that ought to sound vaguely familiar to theater practitioners like actors, playwrights, directors, uh, and, and directors who actually make their living by putting words in other people's mouths, oh, and yeah. by calling it performance, and then if all goes well, uh, uh, by sometimes calling it art, the kind of art that when worth the effort, all too often needs the protection, uh, needs uh, to be protected by the constitutional provisions uh, uh, like the First Amendment, which specifically states that, quote, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech, unquote. But, under, uh, but even under such provisions, theater has always been a bit of a thorny problem. And I would suggest that it's not a matter of coincidence that theater, as a problem, indeed as a problem that's never really been resolved, found its way into the defining moments of how the courts have interpreted the First Amendment, not so much in terms of what the First Amendment protects, but in terms of what it doesn't. Nor was it a matter of coincidence that I would, I would suggest furthermore that those defining moments came as the highest courts were considering the limits of free speech specifically with respect to forms of political activism that the lower courts had ruled seditious. In no uncertain terms then, the court's deliberations on the limits of free speech placed theater and the problem of theater as such at the site of juridical processes that sought to regulate, indeed to censor, political activism judged to be a clear and immediate existential threat to the state. This is not where we would normally locate theater, but perhaps it's time that we should. It's worth considering whether the notion of theater that haunted the court's deliberations on free speech and sedition speaks to theater's most radical potential. For if it does, it speaks to a radical potential in theater that, ironically enough, the courts recognized and sought at some level to contain, but, the, but that performance practitioners have overlooked and rarely exploited. If nothing else, this talk, and the, or actually this chapter that I'm working on, uh, uh, is a call to embrace that radical potential, not merely with an abstract enthusiasm, but with the kind of calculated deliberation that might position it as a key strategy in 21st century creative activism. But before moving into a more detailed discussion of what this potential means and of how it played out in the court's deliberations on the limits of free speech, let us be clear about what kind of poten potential is at stake here. Uh, in those decisive deliberations on free speech that the court undertook in the first part of the 20th century, theater only became an issue when it was used to illustrate a point about the limits of free speech with respect to the political activity of American socialists during the First World War. So with regard to theater, the concern in those rulings was never about a mode of theatrical practice that was in itself literally and demonstrably seditious, uh, uh, even though theater's primary modes of artistic expression are the gesture, the act, and the event, all of which, at, in the abstract at least, have seditious potential. Granted, theater is a cultural event, and yet it is also uh, uh, always a dangerously social-political event in potentia, as well. An implicit acknowledgement of the social political potential of theatrical events is an undeniable part of why the modern legal interpretations of the First Amendment began with theatrical references. And though I've been dancing around those references a bit, uh, uh, we know them well enough. In fact, a presumption of familiarity was with them uh, was uh, uh, with them was on full display when Christopher Hitchens opened his remarks uh, in the debate at the University of Toronto with a flash of melodrama, crying out "Fire! Fire! Fire! Fire!" and then telling those present, "Now you've heard it." Unquote. 
uh, as was obvious to his audience, Hitchens cry of fire, a cry that instilled zero panic in, the, uh, in Hart Hall, was an implicit critical retort to the well-known formulation by the Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., who in 1919 famously argued that, quote, the most stringent protections of free speech would not protect a man in falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing panic, unquote. The fact that Hitchens could safely assume his audience's familiarity with this statement some 90 years after it was written speaks to the pivotal role that it's played in much of the popular imaginary, as, uh, as much in the popular imaginary as in legal hist history with respect to what does and does not qualify as free speech. But at some level, Hitchens' ec uh, clever echo of the shout of fire arguably missed the point of Holmes's allusion to theater. For the cry of fire in the theater is only as important as the effect it yields. And I would suggest that Hitchens could have made better use of his and everyone else's time if he had forgone the grandstanding cry of fire and actually said something capable of instilling panic in the audience assembled before him. For this is the test of the limits of free speech implicit in Holmes' statement, and it is the test of theater in Holmes' argument as well. But perhaps even for Hitchens, this was territory beyond the pale. His cry of fire was an easy opening gambit to his talk because it was harmless. But what the times demanded then in the midst of, this is 2006, in the midst of a war predicated upon false claims regarding weapons of mass destruction in Iraq was something more than the vacuous cry of fire. Then, and even now, what the times demand is a rigorous inquiry into the kind of proclamation that still has the potential to generate panic in the theater today. And more important still, they also demand an equally rig rigorous deliberation concerning the kind of panic that's actually worth the effort. Uh, uh, there's no need for the cultivation of panic for panic's sake, any more than there's the need uh, of shock for shock's sake. But maybe there is a need to revisit and revive what Holmes and his colleagues on the Supreme Court attempted to suppress back in 1919. Maybe it's time to remember that the kind of panic ensuing from the false shout of fire uh, uh, in the theater to which Holmes alluded is the consequence of being so rattled and unnerved that one has an overwhelming sense of urgency to vacate the building for fear that the building itself has become a danger. Only the issue here is not about a practice of theater that causes one to abandon the architectural structures or even the established conventions of theater as such. It's about a kind of political activism inflammatory enough to cultivate a similar panic vis-a-vis -vis the public's faith in the established institutions of the governing political order. The kind of panic accompanying the realization that the political institutions in which one has placed one's trust are the burning timber of something treacherous. The issue in Holmes' statement concerns an activism, in short, that is compelling enough to make plausible the urgent need to exit the established political order so as to seek alternatives. This is the incendiary nature of sedition. It is what Holmes' famous example of someone, quote, falsely shouting fire in the theater and causing panic, unquote, was intended to illuminate by way of analogy. And it is the substance of what the most famous phrase of that 1919 opinion uh, of Holmes, uh, in that, the most famous phrase of that 1919 opinion, Holmes called the kind of, quote, clear and present danger, unquote, that the courts must single out as being beyond the protections provided by the First Amendment. The analogy likening the presence of a clear and present danger to, in the state to a false shout of fire in the theater was the cornerstone in the logic of the opinion that Holmes penned for the unanimous Supreme Court decision in the case of Schenck versus the United States, 1919. That case was the very first to reach the Supreme Court concerning the limitations of the constitutional guarantees regarding free speech, and it examined whether the First Amendment rights of Charles T. Schenck had been violated when after making plans to distribute a leaflet that challenged the constitutionality of uh, conscription, 
i.e. the draft, uh, uh, and that uh, questioned the reasons for Amer American involvement in the First World War. He was arrested and convicted on charges of, quote, obstructing the draft in violation of the Espionage Act of 1917, which was the, uh, seditious, uh, uh, the act, Sedition Act. Uh -uh. all of which fell under the broader categories of seditious activities and all of which Holmes likened to a panic inciting moment in the theater. Uh, the general consensus among legal scholars almost immediately following the court's decision against Schenck and his appeal of that conviction was not only that the court had seriously misread the Constitution in its decision against him, but also that Holmes's analogy did not fit the case under consideration, which simply put was not about theatrics or false cries of fire, but about a group of socialists questioning the constitutionality of the draft and the justification for U.S. involvement in the First World War. One can obviously debate whether the court misread the Constitution uh, in the decision it rendered in Schenck versus the United States. One can also question the curious mismatch in the analogy that Holmes constructed with his reference to the theater and that he used to justify the court's rejection of Schenck's claim to First Amendment protections. But what's never really been examined are the underlying assumptions about theater itself that were a part of that of the opinion that Holmes wrote in the case of Schenck. For at the most basic level, that opinion arguably was as much a judgment against theater as it was against Charles Schenck. Indeed, Holmes's constructed analogy betrayed, if not a poor understanding of theater, then at the very least a deep anxiety about it with respect to what the First Amendment would and would not protect. That anxiety ought to be uh, readily apparent to anyone taking time to consider, for example, that of all places, it is in the theater that one would most expect to find someone falsely shouting fire. For this is what theater does. False cries are the very substance of its arts, and they are theater's urgent reminder that its important lies in the fact that it seldom says what it actually means, and in the fact that its profoundest moments are consistently the product of being at ease with its own false cries because its false shouts of fire and its false cries more generally